We've been looking the last couple weeks at this passage from Acts chapter 2, describing the, the passion, the vitality, the priorities of the early church within the first weeks, months after the day of Pentecost, after the church was formed, after more than 3,000 were added to their number in that day. And within this passage, describing what their church life was like in those early days. There's a word, a powerful word used to describe them, a word devoted. Some translations translate it, uh, these followers of Christ continued steadfastly, which is really what it means to be devoted. Some translations actually say they were continually devoted because that's that's the, the language, that's the verb tenses involved there. It's, it's not just they made a single decision. It's not like they just say, okay, I signed my name, I'll, uh, I'll say yes to that question. No, this was a way of life. They were continually devoted. They continued steadfastly. These were priorities. These were things that were really important to them. And it showed in their choices, it showed in their lives. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. We saw that two weeks ago. What was central to their fellowship, what brought them together in a faith community was the centrality of Jesus Christ, that he had come into this world, that he had died, that he had risen again. And he had revealed the Father to them in, in all of those things and had opened the way for them to have mercy and grace, forgiveness, new life here and the promise of life eternal beyond this life. That was all central to the apostles' teaching. They were witnesses of these things. They heard him teach. They, they walked with him. They talked with him. They saw him. They saw him die. They saw him alive again. More than 500 people at one time saw him alive again. The teachings of Christ became the center of the apostles' teaching. And the church devoted themselves continually to the truths at the center, the teachings, the life, the death, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Secondly, they devoted themselves to the fellowship. And we talked last week, this is not just devoting themselves to hanging out with friends. That's important. That has a place. And even outside the circle of the church, that has a place. Jesus, following his example, he didn't just hang out with the twelve, did he? He took time to be with people. Sometimes he hung out with people who he was criticized for. The, called a friend of sinners, he hangs out with tax collectors and, and the, the, the low life, so to speak, according to some other people. And that has its place, but it's important that our central commitment here, that, that our devotion be to, to the body of Christ, to the fellowship to the community of God's people, whether it's when we're gathered in worship, whether we're serving together, or whether we're apart from each other, but still one in heart and mind in all that we're doing. The early church had that deep commitment, that continual commitment that showed itself. And thirdly, and where we come today, Luke writes, they devoted themselves to the breaking of bread. Now, just the language that's used, the words that are used here, this could speak of what we do on a regular occasion when we gather around a table and have a meal. And we might do that with a friend. We might do that with someone else in our church family. And we might call that breaking bread together, sharing a meal. And yes, the words here could mean that. I believe that they mean more than that in this context for two reasons. One, because it's in a list of four things that were, were a part of their worship life together. The apostles' teaching, the community that, that was formed, and in each one of these, it uses the definite article. It doesn't just say they devoted themselves to some teaching. It doesn't say they devoted themselves to some fellowship. It doesn't say they devoted themselves to some breaking of bread. It says to the apostles, the teaching of the apostles, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread. Later on, we're going to find a reference to breaking bread, which is not so specific. 
And I think that's talking about sharing meals together. And we'll talk about that perhaps in a few weeks. We know that the early church was committed to proclaiming the, the centrality, the significance of the death of Jesus Christ. And while that was obviously central to the apostles' teaching, the symbolic ordinances of the Lord's Supper were also important. The symbolic ordinances of the bread and the cup would help both to, to picture the meaning of Christ's death and also to, to pass this ordinance along, this tradition, this ritual along, to pass it on to future generations. As a picture, it's something physical that we can look at that's, that's a tangible reminder. Jesus said, this bread... This bread which you're about to eat, it used to have a, a different meaning for you as part of the Passover. But now I'm giving it a new meaning. This bread, I want you to picture when you look at this bread, think of it as representing my body. And as we break this bread, think of my body broken. And I know not one of Jesus' bones were broken, but death, even just the, 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 the torture, the, the, the lashes, all of that we still say a body, a body becomes broken. Don't get hung up over those terms. We can still speak of Christ's body being broken for us. And the cup, Jesus said, this cup has significance. When you drink it, I want you to think of my blood, which is to be shed for you, shed for the forgiveness of sins. And so even in these elements, there's, there's like this, this three-dimensional picture. And it goes beyond that. There's also a picture in the act of eating the bread, the act of drinking the cup. There's a picture of taking something into us, and I've said this a number of times before, but I think, I think we need to remember it every time we approach the Lord's table that, that I think Jesus was very purposeful in, in instituting this for us, that in the same way that we take bread and drink into our bodies and in some marvelous way, the nutrition in those elements feeds our bodies and, and actually feeds and nourishes and becomes part of every living cell in our body. We think of the spiritual significance that, that when, we, when we take the bread and the cup and we recommit ourselves to following Christ in, in that act of sharing in the communion, when we once more come to him and say, I need the mercy represented in these symbols. I need the mercy that was shown at the cross. When we come with that spirit, we come humbly. We come seeking God's forgiveness, seeking his blessing, and recommitting ourselves to him. That it's like we're taking that in. And, and, and God's desire is that the truth at the center of this, the mercy of God becomes so much a part of every, every part of our life, every, every cell of our spirit, so to speak. And it nourishes us in our spirit. So there's a picture in that. There's also a, a sense of perpetuation that as a, as a ritual, this is something that we do regularly. Certainly as a backdrop, this was the Passover. This was for the, for the Hebrew people. This was a special, a special meal. And I want to read just a few verses from Exodus chapter 12 where where God instituted the Passover to kind of give us an idea of, of what God was thinking at that time that we can perhaps read into what God, what God desires for us and how he desires us to consider the bread and the cup, the communion of Christ. In Exodus chapter 12, as he was giving Moses instruction about, about how they would observe the Passover, remember this was, these instructions were given before they actually left Egypt. The last plague, the death of the firstborn. And God had given instructions about how they would, would take a lamb and, and they would kill that lamb and take its blood and put it over the doorpost and the frame of the, the door of their house. And he said, when the angel passes through to, to take the life of every firstborn in Egypt and when he sees the blood of that lamb over the doorway of your house, the angel will pass over that household. And death will not be visited upon the firstborn in that family. And even before it happened, he says, now, in years to come, on this specific day of this specific month, every year, 
I want you to take a lamb. I want you to sacrifice it. I want you to, I want you to go through these motions. I want you to do these different things so that you'll remember. He says, each year from generation to generation, you must celebrate it as a special festival to the Lord. Later on, celebrate this festival of unleavened bread, another name for the Passover. For it will remind you that I brought your forces out of the land of Egypt on this very day. There's a sense in which doing this every year reminds us. Celebrate this day from generation to generation. A few verses later, remember these instructions are a permanent law that you and your descendants must observe forever. When you enter the land the Lord has promised to give you, you will continue to observe this ceremony. Then your children will ask, what does this ceremony mean? And you will reply, it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord. For he passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt. And though he struck the Egyptians, he spared our families. Part of the benefit of ritual, of tradition, is, is it happens on a regular basis, every year, twice a year, four times a year. However often it happens, it's something, it's an opportunity for our children then to see and to participate. And, and it becomes part of their life and to ask questions and to realize, okay, this is, this is done for a reason. And we explain why it is we do this. And we pass that on to future generations. But there's another way to look at this as well and in terms of sometimes we say, well, I don't, I, I, don't, really, I don't really respond to ritual. Well, I, I want us to think that even the context of, of relationship, and we say, well, yeah, relationship's what matters, not, not ritual. But I think we can see where they, they walk hand in hand. I think of some families even within this congregation. You want to communicate within your family that, that family really matters and family is important. And we try to be there for each other. And one of the ways some of you try to communicate that is that every Sunday night or whatever night it is, whatever it is, we have family night. That's a ritual. <laughs> but it's a ritual with a purpose to reinforce the importance of family. Those families who do that, it's not only about the ritual. It's also about when someone has a need or someone's ball game or this thing or that thing where they're supporting each other and that's, that's the heart of it, but there's, there's a certain structure that's in place that's kind of dependable. It's not only spontaneous. I would suggest that a healthy marriage has both. It has lots of room for spontaneity, for, for responding to, to different things just in, in life and, and in, in the life of the marriage. But it's good to have, to have certain things that maybe are predictable, that we can count on, that are part of what we do together. And I think that's an important part of this, to recognize that this is not the extent of our relationship with God, but this is a ritual this is something traditional. This is something that is scheduled that can help to kind of give us some structure for that relationship. And in all the in-between times, there's lots of room for the spontaneous, lots of room for, for the highs and lows of life, turning to God when we're, when we're thrilled, when we're grateful, turning to God when we're struggling, when we're at a valley. There's lots of other opportunities to do life in relationship with God. But it's good to have some structure like this provides. Luke says they devoted themselves to the breaking of bread. We think of this word devotion. It's a word that speaks of not just being devoted to doing something, devoted to a practice, but it's a relational word of devotion. And I would suggest that the bread and the cup Create an opportunity to reaffirm our relationship with God through Christ. The bread and the cup provide an opportunity to also reaffirm relationship with each other within the body. And not just within a congregation, but within a family of churches and with other families of churches. Both across the street and around the world. 
in Matthew's Gospel. We read in chapter 26, while they were eating, gathered at what we now call the Last Supper, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you the truth, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. This is my blood of the covenant poured out for the many for the forgiveness of sins. I don't know how many of you knew the song that Sheila played as our prelude this morning. Song referencing a psalm where it says that as far as the east is from the west, God has removed our transgressions from us. That's how great his mercy is. And this song is written, the songwriter struggling with God, just how far is the east from the west? Because sometimes I feel like I can't get past my struggles, my weaknesses, my sins. And the answer is it's as far as one, one, scaled hand, one scarred hand to the other. Basically, the cross shows us the depths that God would go to to show his mercy to us, to forgive us. And may that, that picture also be present with us as we come to the Lord's table um, here this morning and, and share in it together.